Hello. This video is going to introduce different laws for flow and transport, but hopefully to show some commonality between them. Although the symbols are going to be different, fundamentally the maths is all the same. So I'm going to start with Fick's law of diffusion. So imagine, so a box here, and we got some particles here and some particles here. Okay, and these particles can be, for instance, something in air, or it could be something dissolved in water. I don't necessarily have to have a porous medium present either. Okay, so we've got some particles here, some particles here. And Although I've drawn a line here, this is an imaginary barrier. It's not a real barrier. So these particles just move randomly. Random thermal motion. OK, so they're just moving randomly. But the reason why I've drawn a line here is what would be the flux, the net flux of particles across this boundary? Well, I think intuitively the way I've drawn it, you can see there are more particles here. And as they move randomly, it's eventually they're going to even out. So you have a constant concentration of particles. So while they're more here than here, there'll be a flux of particles in this direction. Now let's try and make this a little bit more mathematical. Let's call the concentration here C and at location x. And then let's imagine that the average here, some location delta x away, is c at location x plus delta x. Okay, And that concentration we're going to measure actually in numbers of particles per unit volume. So this will be the units of c will be moles per cubic metre. Okay. So imagine in some unit time, OK, and that time could be measured in seconds, for instance, that some fraction f of these particles will move so that they, trans, they, they move across this boundary. But c is just proportional to the number of particles. So what's going to happen is a number c x times f this is the fraction that will move across, OK? We'll move from left to right. And then some fraction f times the concentration at this other location will move from right to left. We'll move the other way. So the net flux, OK, can be written like this. Now let's just think about this, we can write it in a different way if we like. We can write it as minus f c of x plus delta x minus c of x. And then if we assume that this is a small difference, we can write this as minus f delta x dc dx. Now the key point here is that the net flux, even though this is a random motion, so the particles are just as much likely to move this way as this way, OK? But just some fraction moves across my boundary where I'm defining flux, OK? So some fraction moves this way, some fraction moves this way. There is a net flux from left to right simply because there's more material here. And don't worry about the f delta x. The flux itself is then proportional to a concentration gradient. So Fick's law of diffusion says that the flux of particles okay, can be written as minus a diffusion coefficient times a concentration gradient. And in 3D we can write this in vector form. F is a vector and it's minus D times the gradient in concentration. And that's traditionally how Fick's law of diffusion is written. So this is my concentration. This is measured in moles per cubic metre. This is a gradient, so the units of this is going to be moles 
per cubic meter and then with another meter. D here is a diffusion coefficient and its units are meters per second. And my flux, therefore, is the number of moles per square meter per unit time. OK, so you can see the units all work out. So that's fixed law of diffusion. There is a flux that's proportional to a gradient. So let's just go through that. How much is moving? This is just material. How much is moving is proportional to the gradient in concentration. It's, there's a minus sign because you go downhill. You go from high concentration to low concentration, not the other way around. That doesn't make sense. So that's why you have to have the minus sign here. And then you have a coefficient in front, which we call the diffusion coefficient, which is a coefficient that measures both the properties of the particles and, and the medium in which they are. The last thing I'm going to say is, well, we are looking at flow in porous media. So what happens if we have a porous medium? Well, if we have a porous medium and we're looking at particles within a fluid, something, for instance, dissolved within a fluid, a contaminant, for instance, in water, um, its diffusion is going to be restricted because it can only move through the pore space. So traditionally, how we write this is that the flux is minus D times porosity times a concentration gradient. But even then, the diffusion coefficient, because of the complexity of the geometry of a porous medium, isn't necessarily exactly the diffusion coefficient you'd see in bulk. But this is just traditionally how that is written. So that's my first law, fixed law of diffusion. Now we're going to look at the other laws. So I've introduced fixed law. What about Fourier's law? And this is for heat conduction. Well, again, think physically about a solid, for instance, a metal bar that you heat at one end. How does the bar get hot? It's the random thermal motion of the atoms within the metal. So here we have heat transport, again, driven by random motion. So it shouldn't come as any surprise that Fourier's law can be written in much the same way. There is a flux, a heat flux, that I can give the symbol J or F if I wish, OK? And that's equal to a coefficient here, which is the heat conductivity. And now the gradient is a gradient in temperature. So in heat conduction, Heat flows from high temperature to low temperature, so downhill. OK, that's why it's minus grad T. OK, and the flux, the heat flux, is simply proportional to that gradient times a material property, which is the conductivity, the thermal conductivity. So yes, OK, it's a gradient of T, not C. I've used a J, not an F. Right. There's a kappa here, and I'm sorry that's the same as curvature, but that's what it is. There's a kappa here, not a D. But mathematically, it's the same. Flux equals minus gradient of the thing that you're interested in, and then there's a coefficient in front. Now, let's just get the units straight. OK, temperature is measured in Kelvin. The gradient will be Kelvin per metre. OK, the flux... OK, is going to be in what? Watts per square metre, joules per second. So energy, it's an energy flux. So this is going to be in joules per second, right? which we can sometimes write of watts. And this is per unit area, a bit like my diffusive flux was moles per square metre per second. So now let's look at the units now of K. OK, so K... To make sense, this is actually watts per square metre per Kelvin. OK, and that kappa or K is the thermal conductivity. OK, well, seeing as how we're mentioning conductivity, what about electrical conductivity?
same idea. This is Ohm's law. Now, Ohm's law, most people think, yeah, it's um, resistivity. V equals IR, voltage is current times resistance. But actually, you can write it in a differential form like this. You can have J, which is a current density, is minus an electrical conductivity times a potential gradient or a voltage gradient. OK, so this would be this would be in amps per square metre. OK, this would be a voltage gradient in volts per metre. And this would be an electrical conductivity. So sigma here, and again, we've used sigma in other ways, but we're running out of Greek symbols. But this will be an electrical conductivity. Now, I'm not going to use Ohm's law in my course because it's I'm not an electrical engineer. But again, it's the same. There is a flux here of electrons or current that's driven by a potential. So it's the gradient in potential multiplied by an appropriate conductivity. Now, what's the last law that we're interested in? Well, we're interested in flow in porous media. So our last law is, of course, Darcy's law. Now, Darcy's law fundamentally comes from the Navier-Stokes equations. And it comes from the Navier-Stokes equations, assuming slow flow, slow steady state flow. So they're no non-linear turbulent terms and there's no time dependent terms. So without boring you with the mathematics, essentially it's relatively straightforward to think if I simply double the driving force, I'm going to double the flow rate. It's as simple as that. It's just a linear relationship between flow rate and driving force. And in its general form, and the form I'm going to use, it's written like this. So Q here is not a velocity, it's a volume of fluid that flows per unit area per unit time. So it does have the units of metres per second, but it's actually a volume per unit area per unit time. So Darcy's law is flow, right? It's, it's a flux of material, OK? Mu is the viscosity, OK? That's measured in Pascal seconds in SI units. K is the permeability, P is the pressure, but we also have a gravitational term because flow is downhill. So the two minus signs cancel there because flow is naturally downhill, but flow is also from high to low pressure. Just like high concentration, low concentration, high temperature, low temperature, high voltage, high potential, low potential. It's always the same. It's minus gradient times some coefficient. Darcy's law is a little bit more complicated because we also introduce the viscosity, because it does depend on the, on the fluid, and then K is a property only of the porous medium. And if we think about the units here, pressure is measured in pascals. If it's a gradient, it's pascals per metre. OK, you see the pascals cancel out here, and to get metres per second, the units of permeability are actually square metres. OK, traditionally written as Darcy's, but fundamentally it's an area. So now let's just, uh, just go through this. Fick wrote his Law of Diffusion in 1855. Fourier was actually the first to come up with a law. This is 1822. OK. Ohm's Law is 1827. And Darcy's Law is just one year after Fick, 1856. So you see here... You know, you're in the, the 19th century. You think of a phenomenon, right? Something is moving, right? It's current. It's heat. It's fluid flow. It's concentration. That's governed by a gradient. And there's some coefficient. So this is, you know, how to get your name on a law. They are all fundamentally the same. But actually, none of these people were um, the very first people to do it. Um, but they were certainly all brilliant scientists. Fourier, a bit like Laplace, an absolutely brilliant mathematician 
and scientist in the Napoleonic era. Again, from a modest background, the son of a tailor, he was promoted by Napoleon, didn't manage to become a marquis, though, um, in the restoration of the monarchy, um, but certainly has contributed lots to science, not just Fourier's law, but Fourier transforms, but like the Laplace transform, obviously, if you're a brilliant French person of that era, you had to have a transform uh, next to your name. But the person who started all of this was actually Robert Hooke in 1676. So Hooke's law of elasticity. Now this wasn't really written in terms of a flux and gradient, it was more that there was a linear relationship between stress and strain, right? So the, or the force on a spring was proportional to the extension of a spring. So the very first sort of linear law, there's a relationship between one thing and the next with some coefficient, which is your spring constant, actually dates back a lot further to Hooke. The amusing thing about Hooke is that this was the early days of science, and so he thought he was very clever to be the only person in the world to know this. So he wrote it in an obscure way in Latin so that he could claim that he was the first to think of it, but he didn't really publish it. Um, it only really became apparent that he thought of his law um, after his death. So these are the laws. What I suggest you do, again, don't overthink the various terms. Oh dear, this is a P, this is a T, how do I deal with it? They're all fundamentally the same. Flux equals minus coefficient times gradient.